hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have a plethora of information for you today about static code analysis with JavaScript projects. Thank you for joining me on this session. My name is Iran Tal, and I'm a developer advocate here at Sneak. Uh, and thank you for joining this Sneak Live sessions where we broadcast every uh, every two weeks on a Tuesday, 3 p.m. UTC. So uh, today, without further ado, we are going to do some live hacking together uh, with uh, with Lily Castillo. Uh, I'm gonna add her in a second, but you know, just to like just create the tension a little bit, um, we have a few things ready for you. So uh, before I get off with uh, the agenda, uh, maybe let me add Lily. Let's add her. Uh, Lily, let's see, can we add you in? Hello, Lily. Hey. What's up? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. You ready for this? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's go through the agenda for what we have. I'll, I'll go ahead and add it to the screen. So uh, this is you, and it looks like you use a hat. <laughs> My mom knitted me that hat, actually. This is her lockdown hobby. Really? Yeah, <laughs> she's gotten right. really good. Should I, uh, should I order one uh, that is uh, Yoda themed? Mm, I will check with her. She hasn't done uh, patterns before, but she did make me one with little ears. With what? Ears, like Wait. it's a little bear. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, cool. We uh we have it, uh, we have the things going here. Um so let's see what's on the agenda today. So first off, we're gonna meet Lily. Hey Lily, this is you, technical services architect. Did I get that right? That is correct. Do you right. know what a technical services architect does? I've no idea, but I'm pretty sure you're gonna tell me in a few seconds. Absolutely. <laughs> Cool. So we have that. Um, we are going to chat about uh, study code analysis uh, for JavaScript projects, developers. Uh, this is basically the, the professional name for it. There's like SaaS tools. We'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, you ran an interesting poll, so we'll go through that one and see, you know, what people replied on Twitter and like what you asked. You know, what are the Twitter uh, poll results for it? We'll then do. Uh, we'll introduce you. We'll know you. What you know? What brought you to security to work at Snake and all of those things. Uh, there's a live coding and live hacking sessions where we'll. Uh, this is the first time we'll, we'll, I will be doing uh, this uh, 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 VS Code live sharing thing. And Lily, you showed me this one. This is going to be a fun one. Um, hope you're going to uh, you know fix all of my uh, security vulnerabilities, or maybe we'll do it the other way around. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll is, see. Yep, yeah, this is it. And uh, there, there's there's a there's a surprise. There it is. Lily's favorite movie picks at the end. I know one of them. I actually knew uh, the second one today, maybe. Uh, but you are in for a treat. So stay tuned until the end, and uh, we'll go through them. You ready for that one? Did you prepare in advance? I really did not. So we'll see what pops up into my head when that comes around. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get at it. I mean, uh, let's start with you, Lily. Um, I'll uh, remove this. We can focus on you. Tell us okay, a little great. bit. What is your background? Awesome. Um, so I'm a technical services architect at Sneak. And I'll explain a little bit what that is, because most people don't seem to know what, <laughs> what I do. Um, technical services architect uh, basically means that I spend a lot of time with customers on customer calls, understanding their needs, and sometimes also potentially building custom solutions for them. This may mean adding something into the product outside of the roadmap. Or it could mean building a custom tool, which is usually in TypeScript. And the idea is that I want to say a DevRel, but internally to sort of uh, to sort of show sneak what our customers are actually experiencing when using the product and what their needs might be, so we can tailor our features better for them. I love that. So you're basically uh, on the technical services team right now because you want to move to DevRel. At Sneak, right? Like, <laughs> uh, is, you're planning is that a hint? Over. Is that a hint? Yeah, it's just you know one step towards DevRel. Well, we're always recruiting, so we're gonna be here. lucky to have you. Uh, so basically, what if I got it right? Uh, you're kind of like enabling developers who are customers, like you're learning about what they do, what are their needs, and bridging you know whatever uh, you know gaps we have, like the the, the product uh, related uh, features that they need. You're basically building that for the customers. Exactly. So sometimes you might build a feature on the team for a customer based off you know, a couple of needs. However, once you actually see the customer use the feature, you might realize that that's not quite what they were hoping for. So then it is part of my role to say, 
you know, we have built what we believed was right, but now that we've watched them use it and watched the sort of the challenges they might be facing, it might be best if we tweak it over here. Um, so it's just trying to bring the experience the customers are actually having back to the people building the features as well. And sometimes building those features myself or within the team. It's really cool because like everyone have their own, like no matter how you build a feature, everyone needs their own customization for their own workflows. And uh, I guess that kind of like trickles back into the product to like understand like maybe a lot of customers need a specific thing and that ends up as an actual feature, I guess. They did. Exactly. Is exactly. So, yeah, absolutely. So sometimes you might think that a customer request is very unique, but then as more and more customers pop up, um, tech services would have built a tool or a workaround while product, it doesn't make sense to add it to the product yet. But as the use cases pile up, it would make sense to introduce it as a fully fledged feature within the product. Got it. Cool. So uh, I have the next one is how did you get into security? But maybe before that, how did you get into Sneak? Because I remember when I joined, I think you were you were on Sneak already. So um, uh, what's All your right. Sneak? <laughs> um, before Sneak, I was working at an agency. So actually, my story of how I got into Sneak and how I got into security are the same. I was working at a digital agency before I got into Sneak. And you end up sort of building a lot of websites that are very much cookie cutter websites, you build a lot of components, put it together, kind of change the design, tweak it a bit to apply the brand. So once you've finished all of the components, the challenges kind of go away where you are left with sort of putting components together. It's a bit like Lego. And after doing about six of those, I wanted to see what else I could do, how I could challenge myself. It was my first time working with Node.js as well. So I was really interested to just to see what I could do more on the back end. And I happened to be contacted by a recruiter and they wanted me to chat to this really, really small company I've never heard of called Sneak. And I thought, okay, sure, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, and I mentioned it to my friends and uh, my engineer friends were very excited because they said, oh, oh gosh, Sneak, yes, they're doing such great things right now. Like they're doing like really interesting stuff. And I was like, okay, I've never heard of them. And uh, I, I don't really understand what they do. But after speaking to people there, um, I think I was just sold. I was I was sold on the people. I still wasn't clear on the product, uh, but I have to say once I've joined, um, it became quite clear as the kind of similar security tooling started popping up directly within NPM in GitHub. I knew that I've made the right decision and you know that security was going to be in that kind of workflow because before this, my only experience with security in an agency and previous companies, it was very much we've hired an external company, they're going to do a security audit, and this happens maybe a couple of times a year, and then you get a list of things to fix, and that seemed to be like the process. So it's like, oh, okay, so you know, in six months, we'll, we'll look at security again. And trying to learn more within the company, especially when you are in an agency, there is there's literally no time for you to stop and say, oh, let me just learn about the different vulnerabilities and yeah. how we can do this. It's time is of the essence there. The customers are expecting you to deliver on time as cheaply as possible and trying to sort of do that there and educate yourself and educate everybody else around you just didn't seem possible to sort of make it, I need to become an expert on security so I can write secure code and also give secure reviews. So having a tool that can do this for you and sort of say, you don't need to know everything, but uh -uh, this is not right. Here's a suggestion that that makes it much simpler. Classic, classic security issues, right? At companies, <laughs> no one has time for it. They're not the experts, so they move on. Yeah. Okay. Well, glad we have you to build the tools to like uh, make that uh, make that better in the world. So thank you. <laughs> and um, let me uh, ask. Uh, What's a, what's a recent project you worked on? Oh, this one I'm very excited about. So it is very much in keeping with Steam of Security. Um, something that I've been working on recently as uh, like as a again as a as a special sort of feature in collaboration with product is something that we're calling Sneak Fix. So if okay, you've used the Sneak CLI like... before, let me uh, share my. These are the links you sent me, right? So let me. Uh... Oh, great! Yes, yes, please do. So if you've used the Sneak CLI before, you would have maybe been familiar with Sneak Wizard, where by running the wizard, it was asking you some questions on how you wanted to address the um, 
recommendations for upgrades. Uh, but we found that obviously it's quite tedious to go through if you have a thousand vulnerabilities. You don't want to click yes on each one or you you don't want to decide. You kind of want to say, look, if it's fixable, can you just fix it for me? Apply the recommendations. And that's exactly what Sneak Fix does here. So we're working on a way to automatically apply the recommended fixes for, at the moment, it's Python projects. So that means that you, without doing anything, you can run instead of sneak test, sneak fix, which will run sneak test behind the scenes for you, tell you what's vulnerable, what the recommended upgrades are, and automatically try and apply them for you as well. So then you can just commit and open a pull request and get on with your day. That's pretty cool. So that's basically kind of like shortening the time that uh, you go to like fixing something with sneak audit. This is basically try to fix it automatically. Uh, Mm -hmm. so is this is this not on like a see this is on the open source sneak cli so this is there it's merged is this is this all like already yeah. out so this is out but at the moment it is in the closed beta okay so we're, we're we're trying to get a little bit more feedback to make sure that the output is you know meaningful that opening the pull request with the output provided makes sense before we create it as ga uh, so i'm very excited but this should be happening soon we're also considering uh kind of like a a trial self opt-in potentially for this feature too. I love it. This is great. This is uh, how do I get into this uh, beta program and the feature flag? <laughs> <laughs> I will message you. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Um, okay, what else do we have today? So, oh wait, no. Before that, I uh, I have for you a question as you're uh, sipping through the drink. What is your prediction for 2021? And this can be anything. This can be a sequel to some movies that you like, or uh, or anything else. Okay. Um, I have had a chance to think about this one, and I think there is a tool that I believe will become more popular this year. It's called Rush JS. It is created by Same Fox. It's done. Um, TypeScript, so it is a way to manage your mono repo and your packages and to deal with the releases within the same repo and try and make that a really smooth journey for you. So we already have things like Learner and maybe yep. others that try and do a similar thing, but I found Rush was a, a really nice experience. And so I think that's going to take off. It's interesting. I uh, also had problems with monorepos with Learner and Yarn. <laughs> so is is Rush uh, like the solution for that? Is this like based on NPM or, or unrelated at all to the package manager? Unrelated to the package manager, you choose your package manager, you configure it how you need to, to be configured and it sort of handles the automatic bumps, upgrades, helps you set up your CI and helps you do the releases the way that you need to do. So instead of having, you know, 20, Git repositories, you might just have one with 20 packages in it. I like it. We are going to add the links uh, afterwards in the, the video description. Rush.js, was it? Yes? Yes. I uh, will okay. share the link with you. Oh, there we go. Rush.js.io. All right, cool. So what's, uh, what's next for us? Uh, we have gathered here to discuss about static analysis for JavaScript developers. And uh, let's. what was your experience with that one? Let me uh, share one of the tweets. Like you started out with uh, tweeting about this, right? This is uh, the other day, basically. Almost 100 votes. So we've got, got people here. You want to talk about this, uh, this Twitter poll a bit? Yeah, so I was curious to see whether other people already sort of doing something within the everyday workflow, you know, as they're writing code. As I said, my previous experience has very much been <laughs> every six months, we'll pay some company, they'll come in, they'll scan the code, they'll, you know, try and poke some holes in what we've built, and then they'll give us some feedback. Um, and I am surprised to see that, you know, about 26% are still, are like, what is static analysis? What are, what are you even on about? Um, I don't know why I'm surprised, but maybe it's because I am in the security industry, so my view is skewed now. Um, I'm really happy to see 42% are saying that they do this all the time, so that's really amazing. And I think someone shared an example of how they do this as well. They did? And the other, I think maybe, I, I remember seeing a response. Yeah, here's my setup. Okay, right. With the slint config, that's interesting. So that's basically using the linter to find issues. Interesting. 
yeah, so it's good to see that the, you know there is a high percentage of people that are already just doing this as, as their day to day and have automated it away. Uh, so it's not a six month report from now on. Yep, and I see what's uh, what's going under. Okay, interesting. So we can talk about what is static code analysis, and uh, looks like you know uh, there are some rules here. Um, what do you think about static code analysis? Like, uh, you, did you know about this term before you joined like Snake and the whole security space? I did, I did. I, however, as I mentioned in the places I've worked in, it just it was a thing that you know about, uh, but it wasn't the thing that happened to you every day, and it wasn't the thing that you just did every day. Um, so. I haven't had any experience with static analysis tools until now at Sneak for that reason. But also I haven't been an engineer my entire career. So maybe if I did go into becoming a Java developer, um, I would have then experienced sort of static analysis tools. But after university, it didn't, it didn't feel like the right step for me. Got it. All right, so let's, uh, we'll, we'll dive into it today a little bit more. Um, let's talk about what is, what is SAST. And uh, you know, this is more of like the terminology. So SAS being static application security testing, and that's kind of like a synonym with static code analysis, uh, which uh, goes through your code, right? This is basically, this is code security, that this is a uh, bridge through your code, try to do ASTs or whatever uh, uh, technique it, it can to uh, find all the places where vulnerability can happen. And this has like different, uh, more technical terms like taint analysis, and the source to a sync, which basically means, uh, you know, a source of of input could be the you know user parameters in the query URL, or it can be uh, a JSON request coming in, or it can be a lot of things. And where they flow in in your code, that's kind of like where the sync is. So like this is where if you're not validating, sanitizing, doing uh, something that you probably should to uh, make sure that the code doesn't flow as is, because it could put uh, the application in danger. That is where those uh, vulnerabilities could come in, and interestingly, like with with sneak code, which we're going to look at today, it that it finds more than just vulnerabilities. It actually, I don't know if you managed to look at that, but um, it actually shows you things like if you have secrets, so it would detect them, and a little bit of like misconfigurations. Yeah. Did you see that? That's actually a bit interesting, right? That's a bit more yeah, than just did. vulnerabilities. Yeah, it's. Um, I'm I'm guessing it's you know detection of a pattern or of a common pattern that somebody would write and uh, certain keywords and I guess a mixture of human touch, a little bit of AI mixed together to try and understand if what you've written looks like it. So that needs to be uh, paid attention to. Yep. So we're going to see it now. Let me uh, add my screen uh, to the stream. And what we're going to do next is basically me and Lily together are going to try and code some functionality inside an application that we have that we're using. It's also open source. So like you could experiment and try this out, run hackathons or workshops uh, for security uh, with your development team. So uh, this is all open source and ready for you to use. And sneak code is also free. So we can go with that one. Um, and I have some more like follow-up questions, like why SAS is important and all of those things. But let's go with the code first and see what's going on there. So let me add this to the stream. And we have, I did send you prior to the stream, to the stream an invite to be a code, which we're seeing next. So are you are you able to like interact with it or did you lose the session during the whole uh, the whole intro I stuff? Th I think I have lost the session, so I'll rejoin now. Okay. So while you're doing that, let me take everyone through a bit of uh, what's going on here. So we have this um, goof application, which is a to-do app and uh, it's not running yet. So let me run it. Uh, things are probably a bit slowly because I'm running everything here, which is uh, <laughs> Docker and the live streams and the entire world, basically. And VS Code, don't forget. <laughs> and, VS, uh, and VS Code, yeah. <laughs> you didn't want to make fun of that one to begin with, but <laughs> yep. So we have this to do up, um, which is looks like it's working. Um, it looks like you have joined to celebrate uh, this uh, live stream with me. Do you want to? See if it works. Add something somewhere. Do you want to add a bug? Let's add a bug. Really, this is the day-to-day -day stuff for you, right? You're a developer. You're adding bugs day-to-day, -day, right? Hey, not on purpose. <laughs> 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 Definitely not on purpose. OK, what bug are we adding? Um, I don't know. We can just go ahead with to uh, 
keyboard dog, right? For the dog company. So I've just went ahead and changed that one. Okay. So you can turn it back to cats. Who knows? <laughs> oh, there we go. There that's we a go. secret CLI thing, right? If you use a sync CLI, that's a, that's a commander. There, that is a little bit of an Easter egg. Yes, we do have a command called sneak woof. <laughs> and it can woof in many languages. I will uh, I will just go ahead and... Uh, oh, yeah, it can woof in, in many languages. I do remember that yeah. one. Is it yeah, this? it's uh, one of it. the most loved features. Why don't we have this running on CI and then like, you know, woof, woof. There we go. OK, cool. Learning we about should. <laughs> we should. Okay, but Lily, come on, let's be serious. This is security here. Stop with the games and all this uh, woof woof stuff. Let's uh, let's see what's going on. So uh, we are. So we've shown you basically that we have the app running. I have uh, Mongo in the background. So this is the database. Um, you can add some stuff. You're like, you know, hi everyone, and all of those things. Uh, so but it's we a simple to do app, right? So it's just a basic to do application. No JS. So, yep. It's so basically it. This is. JavaScript, um, plain JavaScript, having vars here, which I know it Ooh. when you saw it, you were like, what's going on early run? I'll be honest, I have a pull request to change them. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't raised it yet, but I'll be honest, I have already started. I was like, you know what? I think we can do const. And you know what? Maybe we should do TypeScript. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy it's for coming. it. So, uh, send it. <laughs> Maybe we'll approve it. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. I, I'm not promising anything yet. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is JavaScript end-to-end. -end. We have the, let me go back to the files here. We have the, the views. You see some of our Dust. Did you know Dust.js? It's a, it's a, no, it's a, it's a template engine from LinkedIn from back in the day where okay. there, would, there was, a, there was a, a framework called Kraken.js. This is back when. Oh, like, I've heard of that. OK, yeah. Heard? So, Dust yeah. was like the, the leading template engine for that one. So we have a template engine with, with Dust here, which we're not going to use today, but it's fun. Uh, we have uh, handlebars and EJS. You have a couple of views and template engines. Uh, so this is you know just the end-to-end -end JavaScript stuff. Uh, but yeah, okay. I'm rumbling and rumbling. But we have a login route, which we're going to use. OK. So you're going to help me build this one, right? How do we do is login? That, is that not so, implemented? Let's take a look. So what have you got? You've got a bunch of routes, app.get. OK, so we've got a logout. Do we have a login? We have an admin. We have a login, and it's a get. So we want to do a post. And we're actually doing a login, right? So we want to do a post to login yep. and create a route. Ooh. I'm just gonna steal that and root start. Do we have a root created? Let's go ahead and make one. Let's see if we have it. Yes, it's in the roots directory, which is loading. Oh yeah, for you it's probably uh, a bit lagging because of the live share, but I uh, should see this. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got roots login handler. So we need to put something here for the login. And I guess uh, you know, we tried username, password, one, two, three, four, just for the fun of it. But like, you know, it's not implemented. We can say this uh, in the okay. UI back. And uh, how does login works? Should we like match usernames and passwords, I guess? Okay, what's the DB here? So it looked like it was Mongo somewhere in the readme. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we want to see if we can find a user that has the username and the password provided. So, you know what? It's still loading for me. It is. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to roll okay. I'll join again. I'll join again while you. Why okay. you keep going? This is just us doing a, a bit of a, a query. This is a standard MongoDB a query doing user that find. Maybe we need to find uh, yeah. one, find all. Did you see? Do you see it or not yet? Yeah. Uh, no. So I'm still logging in. I'm just watching your screen. So if you hover over, it looks like it takes a callback. 
I see it's giving you some hints. So you want a callback function. And Is so this? we want to. Like if the users exist. So if the users, yeah. So if we have any users, let's let's return a 200. And otherwise, let's return a 401. Can do that. So we can say not authenticated or 200 OK for now. Let me replace this with uh, console log. Okay. So I've got a very basic response. Do you have any users in the database? I think it should have seeded them because they have this uh, MongoDB thing with, uh, there you go. It should be the okay. username and the password. Oh, okay, excellent. So let's, okay, so we can do that. All right, cool. So um, that's right. I think, uh, did I run it? Uh, not running the app yet. Or I am, but it's in the other view. We run it in dev mode. It should restart. And save. Okay, and I'm back. Yeah, let's see what's going on. So now admin. Mm -hmm. This was the password. Um, 401, maybe that wasn't the password. We can go back. Super secret password, that's the one. Okay. All right, so it's not showing anything, but this is the 200. Well, that, so that looks like success. Great. Are we done? This is, uh, should we ship it to production? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, why not? Uh, well, it looks like we actually have a little squiggly line under user.find. Do you want to show us what the issue is? Yep. Um, let's see. Show this suggestion sneak. And this one, yeah, remove this one together. So this is the sneak code IDE one. It says, uh, do you want to read this to us? Like what's going on here? Unsanitized input from HTTP request body. And <laughs> I do wonder how, how many times people just go ahead and uh, call it just like that because I mean, why would you expect that you can't just pass in whatever you want, right? True. It looks easy enough. This may result in an SQL injection vulnerability. Okay, so I guess we would like to try and do that. Okay, cool. Let's see. Uh, it's interesting though. Like, why do we have an SQL injection here? I'm gonna close the snake suggestion here for a second, or at least I'll uh, move it yeah. to the right so it uh, doesn't bother us too much on the UI. But really, like the question is like this is MongoDB, so unlike SQL, where you, you would uh, concatenate strings, which is something like a classic SQL injection. Uh, so select, you know, from users where mm -hmm. username. Right, I'll do something like this. Um, username. Uh, going under. Something like this and password. Now, while this might be coming from right this username thing, sorry, this body password, uh, yeah, password. And yeah, you could like pass in something else in the in the password. That's a string. That's like, well, you know, maybe this will be the the password will be here. Uh, something like closing this uh, uh, this whole query parameter. Uh, a mm -hmm. single quote parameter for the query, then you know, doing or one equals one, and then like um, exposing of all of the rest using a comment. And this might work. Uh, the question is like, this isn't, it's not the same here, right? Because we're passing and like this is objects and we're passing some string to the object here. It's like there, there's no, there's nothing to close and concatenize. So like, yeah. why would this be an issue? I'm not sure, but uh, what's the first thing we should do? Like, should we try and validate and sanitize information? Um, I mean, we could definitely do that. Or if you wanted to see how we could exploit it, we could, I guess, take a look at the code behind user.find to have a little peek of what it's trying to do. Um, 
But also, why why do we think we need to sanitize it, right? So right now. Yeah, I was just thinking. I guess maybe we wanna. I guess we wanna see what horrible thing we can pass to it <laughs> to make an SQL injection, which sounds like we'd want to be able to run a query. <clears throat> True. How do you feel about? Uh, let me let me put you um, on the spot with it. It's like if I do validator, which is I have a validation uh, library here. Let me uh, take you through this. Uh, it's an open source. Oh, okay. One. Okay, I can uh, use this. Well, that is email. I'll make sure that request body username is an email. Okay, if that works, let's go in here. If it doesn't, you know, we'll. Uh, Should we 400? Or that, know. yeah. Yeah, whatever. Bad request. So, what does it say? So, it double checks if the username is an email. Okay, nice. This is a good one. Do you know Validator? Let me show you that. Uh, yeah, let's have a look. No, I don't know what that does. Validator is, I'll follow you if I can. Yep, there we go, validator. I think it's not this one specifically. Let's see, it's validator JS or is it validator? That one seems awfully odd. Is this an internal library? Oh, external. No, it's an external, but I don't want to sign in that, to sneak it. OK, that explains why it's showing me a bunch of types when I click through. I think it should be, to, which one is it? I don't know. Okay, so we also want to see oh. not an email, not an email. So now if we try and pass anything other than an email, it should complain. Oh, I see you've updated this. Yep. Yeah. We're basically validating this and like, uh, I mean, let, let's see what's going on when we try to run a query there. I mean, let's go here and see at all if this works. So admin. Just gonna, okay, oh. just gonna return early if it's not an email so we can Skip the nesting. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So if it's not an email, we bail. What else do you think we want to worry about? So let's try giving it not an email. And let's see what's going on. Yeah. Let me yeah. open this one to see that we've got it working. Did you let me save it just so that it? There we go. And. Okay. So that's okay. 200. Let's do it again. Without an email, even the same password. I think it, uh, okay. Hey, that okay, works. great. Uh, not an email, great. Okay, so we have validated for that. What about the password? Do we want to validate for that as well? Uh, I don't know, it's a password. What could, we, what could go wrong? I say uh, continue with this. Okay. All right. I mean, really, a password is just a password, and it can be many things. So, like, it could be um, not even ASCII characters because people might use their own like languages and weird characters and like weird lengths and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll skip it. But um, I want to show you like what happens when we when when people think that and they don't actually. Uh, do anything about it. So to do that, let's 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 try and replicate this login uh, experience through uh, the terminal here. And I'll open a different one here, which we have. I'll go ahead and uh, start adding uh, maybe some curl to uh, the request just to, like see what is going on there. So, yeah. and I guess given it's an SQL injection, we can try and write some SQL. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to submit the form. Uh, not even an SQL, I'm just going to submit the form and send some data into it. So I know I'm okay. going to need uh, username equals something uh, and yeah. password equals something as well. And that's going to close, I guess, my um, request. I'll pipe this over to HTTP, which is a nice little uh, tool for the CLI, and send this over to host 3001 
And was it login? Yep. Okay. That's it. If I do that. Okay, so we should get unexpected. Oh, something is worth it. Unexpected token P. Uh, that's why. Oh, for passwords unquoted. Again. Okay, unauthorized. And it got it, and we can see like this is what we sent. Let's see a correct login. Super secret password. And okay, this one is okay. This is 200. 200. Okay, Great, perfect. But the thing is, where the vulnerability could come from, I guess, is while you know, Sneeko still kind of like yells about this being an issue in our SQL injection. And we've done some validation and we, we could add more validations. But really, the point mm -hmm. is, you know, maybe not understanding the way that uh, databases and how like a lot of the, you know, under the hood things operate. So Here's an interesting no SQL injection that happens, and it's a valid vector I think documented since 2014 or whatever. It's uh, pretty old, and we've seen it in you know previous demos, but it's uh, it's really great to see it, you know, and you know see it, you know, for the first time. And that is, if you're using MongoDB, um, and you know maybe the developer is not really well uh, educated on what it can have, you could basically pass here an object that gives you different things. Like for example, this object gives you an ability to do regex matching or say, you know, it's a string and it has to be greater than, you know, something, a, a number or whatever else. So the moment that, yeah, so the moment that you understand that you could pass it as a, like, this is a value to the password key in the database. And then MongoDB like takes these parameters and does whatever it wants with them. Now that things get interesting. And so it's what, a legitimate feature of MongoDB is. that it you is. might want to account for. Exactly. Okay. So you see that that is very interesting. If you if you haven't you know read the docs very extensively, or if you've just come into the code base and just opening a pull request, you're not likely to go and read everything about MongoDB and how it works, and that you can pass an object as well as a string. So True. it would be very easy to send or not think about trying to check which which one you are working with right now. Yep. Exactly. So if you you know, sometimes like you may forget or may use it in different instances. And um, I'll show you like this pattern is very well used. Plus, you know, people just pass parameters to uh, like from the users uh, to this user dot find or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. you know what going to be uh, uh, queries. And without thinking too much about the fact that it's user input actually be, you know, very maliciously changing the impact of what the query would do. So maybe let's let's see it in action and like, now, over here in the bottom of my screen here uh, on the terminal, what I'll do is I'll add this uh, object uh, that says um, greater than basically uh, nothing, null, so or empty string, which means it will match any record that has a username, right? Which is what we're trying to find. Yeah. It's password that's bigger than you know an empty string. Which, any. That's which is all passwords. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully, no okay. one can the password with any. So let's see what happens. Let's see what we get. There we go. 200 OK. What? 200 OK. <laughs> right? Wait, so does it. Does, it, does it matter now if we change the username? Can you make it anything? Uh, it's interesting. We can try. But basically, it will uh, may not find anything. And uh, So will so it validate the username first? to see I there's think no username. Both of those, yeah. So now it's unauthorized, but okay. fine, we can do the same thing here, right? The same game. Oh yeah, let's try that. So basically saying, if any user with any password, please let me in, thank you. <laughs> oh, this is me or the other one? Oh, okay, this is not, this is failing because of validator supposed to be an email, right? Oh, it's but now it's, I received an object. Received an object, which is great. This is our interesting. But then the validator should have said, "Sorry, this isn't an email." Um, no, I think it's just throwing an exception, which is what we're not catching there. Um, which is where is it? I mean, technically, this isn't an email. <laughs> an <laughs> object isn't an email. <laughs> True. 
So I guess it would be yeah, I want someone else to do this for me. Do what? Well, if I'm going to use a validator, I'd like them to oh. think about this <laughs> for me. I love that you're saying that because apparently there's a vulnerability in a validator is email. So I, just, I could actually have uh, um, you know, exploited the fact that you're using validator in a vulnerable version, not even ah. going to this one. So this is where all, this is where the sneak code, the sneak test for the vulnerability that I have kicks in and checks, you know, whatever I have. And uh, maybe if I used your uh, feature flag of fix, it would automatically also fix them for me. <clears throat> Lily? Uh, we don't support nodes yet. Otherwise I would have absolutely enabled that for you already. So <laughs> Python projects for now only, poetry, um, pip and pip. Well, thank you. I will. Uh, I'm not gonna become a Python developer, but thank you for the uh, suggestion. No, I can give you some Django tips. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Uh, let's look at this. Like validator, uh, the version that we're using is vulnerable to regular expression denial of service, uh, which okay. I will not uh, attempt right now with uh, you know dosing my own uh, local environment with everything running here. Uh, that, but we do yeah. have it. We do have the POC for it. So like uh, if you browse the sneak uh, open source, uh, the sneak, uh, sorry, the sneak uh, uh, goof, which is open source app on the, on the repository, you'll see like the whole readme, you can go through it. Uh, and yeah, like this is the way that, uh, you know, issues manifest if we're not fixing them. And this is where sneak code is interesting uh, to see that it highlights those issues for us and tells us, you know, hey, maybe there's uh, there's uh, an input injection or an SQL injection that happens. And we need to be aware of those kind of things, uh, you know, happening. So I'm just thinking if I am um, somebody with not so noble intentions and this is an open source project, could I equally use sneak code for, oh. for to find places where I could exploit the code base? You could. But I guess the fact that the, the source is uh the source is open. So if you have access to the source, it's uh it's game over at that point, right? Like any security yeah. resource would find it anyway. It the tooling just accelerates that process. Exactly. That's why I guess it's very important if you use open source projects to know what you're using and yeah. which versions and be careful with that because everyone else will know too. <laughs> True. But if you're a proactive uh, security researcher and that project has a bug bounty program, you could uh, slide in a security report and tell them about it to be a nice hacker. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So I don't know if we're going to have more time for the rest of it uh, here, but let's explore some some more stuff here that we find with uh, with sneak code, which is interesting. Uh, so if I go to the findings here, that it found twenty two issues. And uh, by the way, you could see that um, if I let's add some dummy code. That's I want to show you that it when I click uh, uh, command save here, it's creating the file bundle, uploading files, which actually just taking a hash like people might be wary of like why does it need to do that but it's actually just taking a hash of the zip plotting it once and then we discard it after we have all of the all of the uh, uh results and then we just compare them all the time so like we're not in the business of trying to uh you know save whatever source code you have just for the sake of analyzing it uh but once it does you can see it took really uh you know a few seconds to basically scan all of it and there's some fine interesting findings like um index.js shows you that we have some issues here, like unsanitized input going here, which looks like we're doing an exec call, uh, which is uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, uh, not uh, not the nicest thing to uh, uh, look at when you look at source codes, uh, especially not when we are spawning a command with taking input from the user input. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I haven't I haven't seen that before, so this is a new one. It's usually, you kind of want to know what you're executing. Yep, but this is happening. Uh, there are more stuff here. The user find, this is what it found for us, the NoSQL injection. Yeah. Uh, um, what else? Um, this is also an interesting find. This is the ability to basically send back to the browser um, user code. So like what's happening here, uh, just to show you kind of like what is going on. This is, this is us, this is the create route. So what it does is uh, when we add a to-do like we did here at the- yeah. In, right, and we add it. Um, it's adding, you know, creating a to do item, like all of this stuff in MongoDB, creating an object, the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's uh, doing a redirect 
uh, and afterwards, like this doesn't have any semantic meaning because like the browser will uh, ignore whatever is here. And you could treat it as potentially a false positive maybe because we're like, you know, doing a base 64 to the string. But if we weren't, and like what we would be doing is something like this, mm. what would happen is truly an, X, uh, an XSS injection because we are sending back to the browser any content that the user created to begin with. So if that's, that gets back to the browser and they just had it like a script alert or whatever, the browser is going to execute it. And the funny thing is why of why that happens is behind the scenes, uh, this is Express. So Express, when you're doing send without specifically um, uh, setting the, the, the content type header, what it does is it defaults to, uh, to that uh, text HTML thing. It's actually sending you back uh, a body of like the, the browser renders this as an HTML. And that's why if you send anything back that the user actually uh, originally added, this is where it's like a bit of a game over because of the XSS here. So you can add a little fun banner to the website, extra branding. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you think. Yeah, extra banner. That's it. Uh, so let's see what else is here. Um, there's a bunch of, of findings, I guess. There's quite um, a few there. Yeah, this is. I like how it gives you little suggestions, like the code diff. Yeah. Over here? Yeah. So this Are they is committable? Where... Can you commit them directly? So I was I was saying this on a previous on a previous um, uh, stream where I was saying you know you could theoretically copy paste like it was Stack Overflow, but then I was like nah, don't <laughs> maybe don't do it because this is uh, <laughs> this is Nico suggesting uh, suggesting um, other projects that uh, commits in open source that have fixed the vulnerability. Right, so it's not guaranteed. It's just like to guide you towards, you know, what's maybe what maybe other projects have done. So it's kind of like Stack Overflow in that sense, give you suggestions, uh, but yeah, like don't copy paste. Like you know, look at this and uh, you know review it properly. Uh, so this doesn't mean a lot, I guess. But let's see if there's like uh, better suggestions here. I don't know. Okay, so here, yeah, it's saying don't hard code your secret. Yep. Essentially. I'm Keep trying. the secret secret somewhere that's not in the repo. That's not in the repo, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to go into the put it in the environment variables or not with you, Lily. Uh, I know where I stand, and I will die on that hill. Uh, but uh, we'll uh, maybe do it in a live stream take two with you. OK, sounds good. <laughs> All right. Um, what else in here? So there's a bunch of stuff, and um, you know, it, it will tell you like it's you know you should disable the expired by headers and things like that. Um, it, it found some issues, so I have some some dummy tests here, and it found uh, apparently some like do not uh, hard code passwords in code uh, that it found uh, things like this. See the wiggly line behind password, and then this is kind of like my password, but it's a test file, right? This is spec.js, mm. and uh, so the way that you would deal with it, like first of all, I guess um, it's a false positive to begin with, right? But it kind of like hints you that it says, you know, it's a security issue, but in test, maintenance, test, mock, it gives you some tags to like let, okay. let you figure out like, you know, what it belongs to, like where did it actually find it? And so, I mean, if this is a valid, you know, false positive, well, first of all, uh, you know, we could say, you know, help the team, you know, let them know. Uh, but more of this, like I might just want to ignore it in this file, and the moment I do it, uh, like it's adding this thing here, uh, just a comment that you know the next time it's comes up, it's just gonna figure out that it needs to ignore it, and I can give it even a reason of why am I doing this. Oh, nice, similar yeah. to like a TS ignore or. Yep, and there we go. Other like kind of planting rules. Oops. That's pretty Great. cool. I'm very excited to start using this. So on our team, we're starting to think about <clears throat> how it needs to be just part of every day. So this is quite new to us as well. So we're also trying to make sure that every line of code that we write has new code run on it. What do you think? You're going to find other fishes or not? I want to hope that no. But the reality is that we're all human. <laughs> there will be something somewhere, probably. I just hope they're false positives, and we can mark them as ignored. Uh, but we'll see. OK. All right. 
I'm, uh, I'm hopeful for that one. But if you do find some interesting stuff, it's always, uh, you know, the security vulnerability that you find today are good stream content for me for tomorrow. So. <laughs> for tomorrow. Are you exploiting my mistakes <laughs> for stream content? <laughs> Um, uh, only if it's fun, you know, only if it's fun to show it in the live stream and you can go here and, uh, you know, share what you found <laughs> or not. I don't know. It depends. I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. I'll let you know what we find. Um, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Maybe cool. there'll be something quirky in there that I haven't seen before. Are you, by the way, going to use it, um, in the CLI like this, or, uh, were you thinking of, uh, waiting for the GitHub integration? So that's a good question. It's going to be a mixture. So today, what we do is we already have a mixture. So in the in the CI pipeline, I would always have sneak run um, before opening the pull request, so that would fail. But even after that, would still also have the integration from GitHub, and that would run separately. So essentially, you're kind of testing your whole pipeline as you go. So this would be exactly the same. So everywhere it can be is going to be. So it's going to be in the IDE. It's going to run before you. Uh, be able to merge the PR and then it's going to run also periodically on GitHub. And that's because sometimes, you know, things that you run in your CI are not 100% the same and the versions are not quite sure. the same yeah. as what you get in GitHub, especially with with Node, you might have a log file in one place, but not in the other, or maybe accidentally you have a log file that's changed in your, in your CI, but that's not the one that gets committed later. There's so many variables. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, so if we're talking about like your CI, like what, or like your dev machine, what I was thinking is, uh, you know how that person, uh, Pella was replying back about like using ESLint, uh, those linters mm. for good analysis. So what do you think about, um, having Git commit hooks in your code that basically before you, maybe not before you commit, it depends on your workload, but before you push it, then it will run that sneak code test. And uh, and the sneak test for open source, so it, it would run all of those, uh, maybe even with like a um, a high flag, uh, like a high uh, severity flag. So it will actually, you know, probably most chances it will naturally have a false uh, positive, and um, like only then it will uh, you will force it, and only then you will uh, fail the build. Did you think about maybe doing something like that? Yeah, so we, we do keep going back and forwards on, you know, using get hooks. And that's because some people find it slows down the push a bit. And so it's like a preference. And in general, so far, we've landed on not having a local get hook, but having it as the first thing that runs in CI. But in some teams or in some previous places, we've always had a get hook. So it depends on the culture that you have. So you definitely have options. So I say wherever is already natural, add it in there. Okay. So it's less friction, works with what you'll know, doesn't doesn't seem annoying. Yeah, I agree, I agree. All right, cool. Um, let's wrap it up a bit. And I think um, any any takes you uh, want to share as we uh, kind of uh, wrap it up? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's quite surprising <laughs> to see that you you know, just something as innocent as allowing multiple input types can be quite dangerous. And it would be interesting to see how this how this plays out if this application uses TypeScript, which I will happily help you convert, because there it might actually complain in some areas where you might be assuming one type or the other, or it might very loudly show you which type it is. So I do wonder if there's also a little bit of surfacing the education of the tools that you're using and what input they're expecting so that you can think about it ahead of time and sanitize that input appropriately. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, TypeScript, like you're a fan and I think it solves a lot of like those mistyping issues for you just by, you know, running the compiler, right? And then finding them out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It just, it helps you educate yourself as well. It's kind of partial documentation of the tools you're using directly in your ID. So it can be very helpful to yep. then not say, I didn't know it did X because it was, it's easy to see what it's, what it's trying to do, but it won't fix it for you still. So it's just one of the ways, one of the tools to, I guess, make it easier. Yeah, no, totally get it. It uh, saves a lot of, uh, I guess, headache at, at the, the long run. Yeah. 
All right, Lily, we are at this uh, point in time where uh, you need to share some of your favorite movie picks. And uh, I promised you uh, I'll surprise you. So I've, you I've got this first one. There we go. <laughs> that is correct. This is definitely <laughs> one of my favorite movies. <laughs> so I think a lot of my fifth element so a, a lot of my favorite mm -hmm. movies are quite old now i think you know when you're younger you're very impressionable you see yep. things they stick with you forever so fifth element is 100 percent one of them i mean the hair may be partially inspired <laughs> you need to go a bit shorter you know more rugged <laughs> um i'd say after that i'm a big fan of anything studio ghibli so spirited away princess mononoke that's 100 percent my kind of thing but anything like that is the kind of movies that I really enjoy. And one that I've really enjoyed that was recent-ish is Roma, the sort of black and white movie following a uh, Mexican living maid. That was fantastic. Not the happiest it. movie, not the happiest movie, but it's just so well done, so well filmed. It follows the story of sort of like a Mexican living maid for a richer family. Hmm. Um, it's very good. Highly recommend. Cool. We'll add the links for that one as well at the end of the stream. So um, yeah, I mean, let's, let's uh, these are your movie picks. Let's go up with uh, resources. So if you've uh, wanted to try out uh, sneak code uh, for what we've you know, showed you and like the way that you want to use it from the CLI, maybe import a project from GitHub. You could actually import, I think, public projects, which are not yours. So, like you could look at what's going on there if you wanted to like maybe help fix something or look what's going on. Uh, but we have it for IntelliJ and VS Code. Lily, this is a good question to ask. Are you a VS Code user or IntelliJ? VS Code. Okay. Down with the JavaScript <laughs> uh, to the trenches. I just find, yeah, it's it just works so well with TypeScript. So that's that's my choice for now. Who knows in the future? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, let's leave IntelliJ for the Java devs. That's that's fine with me. I'm good with that. I did used to use it to to work with Java exactly, and it was well suited for that. But <laughs> I don't know if the design got updated since because last time I used it, it looked very nineties. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a recent screenshot. It looks pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Cool. So if you want to get started with, uh, uh, if you ever move to IntelliJ, uh, Lily, just know that we have VS Code for you there. So you are welcome to try it out. Perfect. Um, what else? If you want to get in touch with Lily, she's on Twitter over here uh, wearing hats, which is nice and very acceptable and welcomed here on the stream. <laughs> uh, so you can just ping her. She's a very active speaker. Uh, what was your recent speaking activity, actually? Um, it was surprisingly, I talked about TypeScript at a Python conference. <laughs> and really? uh, yeah, so I, I applied because they wanted to have like a front end track to sort of, it's quite popular nowadays with Django to sort of use the Django REST framework as your backend. So you would have an API layer and then the front end could be anything modern. So I want to talk about TypeScript to see, to sort of make sure that people knew about the benefits of using a type system on your front end or your back end, but not for this conference, and share sort of our sneak story as well, the, the lessons that we've learned, and some of the things that didn't work for us along the way, and lots of things that we loved. Nice. I like that uh, you've presented that at the Python conference. I guess JavaScript is <laughs> overreaching, I guess, right? It's uh, on the front end, and if you're a Python Java devs, you might still use it, and it's still very relevant. Yeah, for sure. I think React with a Python back end is quite, in, in right now. Interesting. OK. Didn't we move from React to Svelte or whatever that name is? Uh, maybe. Maybe I'm behind now. I need to catch <laughs> up. <laughs> all right. A lot of uh, weekend reading for you. Cool. Um, all right. What's, what is next for us? Uh, let's see. OK. So yeah, if you were going to sum it up, if you want to follow up on the live streams, in the future, we have them on uh, that URL just Basically, if you Google sneak live streams, you'll probably find this. Uh, look at the upcoming sessions that we have for you. It's going to be more hacking sessions, more live coding. We'll try different apps, different things, show you how the vulnerabilities take place and how to uh, uh, you know how to mitigate them as well. Uh, so uh, without further ado, um, uh, 
getting to the end of it uh thank you lily for you know all the time like walking me again also through all of this uh, vulnerabilities and making sure that things are working well and vulnerabilities gets found and uh you know thank you everyone for joining the session today thank you so much for having me this was really fun for me as well so uh see you next time i guess see you next time bye bye